Um, our service today, uh, Pastor James will be giving our sermon, and um, I'll just uh, be starting with the call to worship. Um, and just to remind you that um, I will be reading the lines um, with uh, the text with one, and the response reading um, will be for all, all of us to read together uh, while muted, and um, uh the response reading will will continue on after my um, uh, um, scripture reading. So today's um, call to worship um, reading is from Psalm 78, verse uh, 23 to 29. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he led out the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas, and he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. And they ate and were well filled for he gave them what they craved. Bless the Lord with heart and soul, for our God is great. He will bless God in this time of worship. God sends forth the Spirit to renew the face of the ground. God renew us in this time of worship. God feeds all creatures in due season. God feed us in this time of worship. Let us sing to God as long as we live. We will sing praise to our God while we have being. So we come to worship. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will now continue with the prayer of adoration. Let's bow our heads. God of majesty and mystery, we gather before you in humble wonder. Source of all that is, your breath and depth are beyond our, our imagining. Word of hope and healing, your grace defies our explanations. Spirit of purpose and possibility, you touch us when we least expect it. Receive our praise and prayer this day and prepare us to receive the bread of life in this hour of worship. For we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, as your Holy Spirit prays within us to stir us to new life. In Christ we pray, amen. souls to another Lord give us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another we bow our hearts we bend our knees 
Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We'll turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols to give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. No, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, so give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Lord, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees, O oh Spirit, come make us humble. Let us pray. God of mystery and mercy, you know the details of all of our lives. And you see the sin and the sorrow that we all bear. You see the problems and even especially the possibilities that we face. And yet you see how we take advantage of each other. How we take one another for granted. How we often overlook one another. Oh God, we confess we do not always see what you see. There are many moments we do not see our own sin, our own failures, and our own shortcomings in our own lives and in the lives that touch ours. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, to the truth of our times and cleanse our hearts with your grace, with your love, with your compassion and your mercy. May we hear the good news then today that we may not be sitting in a position that condemns other because only Christ and Christ died for us. And we acknowledge that Lord, you rose again, and that you reign over us. We also acknowledge, O oh Lord, and we thank you, because you continue to intercede and continue to pray for us, even in our broken state. 
Lord, you continue in your faithfulness and your love for each and one of us. And so may we believe today, may we believe in the good news of the gospel. May we put our faith and trust in you, in Jesus Christ, whom we are forgiven, whom we are set free by your generous grace, love, and mercy. In Christ's name, we pray in thanksgiving. Amen. The scripture reading for today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 32. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, and to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through, through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as, as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Miriam, for the scripture reading this morning. This morning, when I was thinking about the message this week, you know, I was um, I was thinking, you know what? There's, it's so exciting that we, uh, uh, I think, many of our small groups have begun to meet in person, and uh, you know, even with social distancing and all that, and we've been meeting in our backyards or at the local park, and and uh, footprints. Uh, yesterday, um, had uh, had had a lunch pizza party together uh, at the center, and so we just we kind of got together and we we had some pizza together and. Uh, and it was just a few of us, but it was it was such a delight to see each other's faces. And uh, after uh, over a year and a half, just being able to see each other in person, um, and, and for some of us, maybe even more, um, we never had the chance to see each other um, bef- even just before the pandemic started, uh, because I happened to be on parental leave just shortly before that, but. It was, you know, it was it was such a wonderful time to just see each other's smiles and faces and and to hear each other's laughter and and not be limited by the pixels on the screen, uh, and and the and the connections that we are constantly cutting in and out and and the minuscule size of the screens where we can't really tell if somebody's falling asleep or whether someone is actually paying attention. And, you know, it's it, it it's refreshing after a year of just seeing each other on the internet, now being able to see each other in person. But uh, I was thinking about this over the last couple of weeks. How, what does this season mean for us? You know, there are many warnings of, uh, you know, possibly a fourth wave because of the variants. And, uh, but, you know, regardless of that, I think we are beginning to, at least here in Ontario or here, in Canada, we're beginning to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. What does life look like then after a pandemic? What does 
life look like when all of this is over? It may take some time, but what does life look like after all of this? And that's a question I had to ask myself. What does, what, what changes for the church? What changes for God's people? The world has changed. We will never be the same again. The way we work, the way we think about life and leisure and, and family and, and all of these things, we've shifted a dynamic. It's shifted in a different dynamic in different ways. In fact, many, many businesses, even in the downtown area, are wondering, will these offices and these office buildings ever be filled up again? Will people be returning to these large corporate environments where there's thousands and thousands of people in these towers? Will it happen again? Some say yes, and some say no. Many companies are gearing up to begin doing remote work and uh, only meeting up in person when it's absolutely necessary. There are many companies thinking that way Many churches have begun to think, okay, how do we begin to respond to changing times where people are not comfortable meeting in larger groups or in larger settings? How do we begin to be the church in this world and share God's word and his love with one another? And so many churches have become very creative in the way they think and the way they think about the future and how, we, how they do ministry. But I want to dig more into a more personal level. How has this pandemic impacted our lives? And how are our lives and our approaches to faith and Christian living every day transform and change? How do we practice Christian faith every day? in responding to the times that we live in. There are some things that have changed maybe for the better. There are some things that have become much more convenient. But there are also things that have become much more in your face. Certain topics, uh, controversial topics, topics of debate, topics of of controversy, topics that of injustice, we can we can refer back to this entire year. We have all the different topics of injustice that have come face forward into the public view, including the the children of the indigenous community that were you know that uh, that were discovered in Kamloops all the way to last year with the Black Lives Movement Matter and uh, Black, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, with all of the things happening last year with injustice towards our uh, Black brothers and sisters, to the topic of Asian hate and, and the hurt that maybe even many of us in our own church community have experienced or are experiencing. There are so many things that have become much more apparent in the public view, much more apparent in our lives, and much more honesty in what we've been feeling and what we've been going through even before the pandemic began. And so as I was thinking about this, how has it changed our hearts? How has it changed the way we conduct ourselves behind the screen versus actually in person. I can definitely tell you after doing youth ministry close to about 15 years now, that many students, even whether it was 15 years ago, or even today, 15 years ago, there was a, um, our, our version of social media was, uh, you know, was ICQ or MSN Messenger which is, you know, my, back in my day, it was MSN Messenger and ICQ. And basically, 
you know, you would log on and, you know, you wait for your friends to log on and you would chat. And it was this whole phenomenon of, of chatting with one another with the emoticons and all that kind of stuff happening. And that was the beginning of social media. But interestingly enough, a lot of the students in those days would rarely say anything in person when you met at a youth group and you know that when you meet them at the beginning they can be the shyest student but then you add them to msn messenger or icq which was the messaging messaging platform at the time they would begin to just divulge everything about their lives it would be so much easier to connect with people and there's a feeling that because there is something in between you, you almost feel like there's some sort of mediating uh, presence there that stops someone from judging you because they can't see your facial expressions. And so in my experience is people have become in some ways both either very dishonest or extremely, extremely honest about who they are. But in that, I've also uh, witnessed that as the years have gone by, social media has also become much more angry. It's become a much more toxic and angry place. The internet has become a very, very angry and uh, anger-fueled place. There are many wonderful and awesome stories of grace and of love, but in many people's view, there is more and more of the anger and a sense of dissatisfaction in people's lives surfacing as we begin to move the facades aside. The beginning of Instagram and, and Facebook, many people, when that began, many people were putting up online all the wonderful things that were happening in their lives. And so there was a facade uh, that everybody's life was somehow happy, prosperous, well-to-do, that everybody was eating well, traveling fancy, and dressing, uh, and dressing all fancy as well. But as time has gone, we all know that what is really the truth eventually surfaces. And when those facades begin to deteriorate and come down, and when we begin to face reality, is that there is much more pain and sorrow in people's lives than we ever thought. And so coming out of this pandemic, one thing I have learned is we must begin to live life a very different way. We need to become more honest or transparent, but we also need to be on a road of healing how do we as God's people and God's church first, before we begin to ask the world to do any sort of healing or fighting for injustice and all of these things, I believe the church and all of the church's people, all of God's people must begin to walk that journey of healing first. We must look at life in that lens first. And when we begin to do that, that is where the work of the Holy Spirit begins in our lives. Let's look at the scripture more closely today. In verse 17 of Ephesians 4, it says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. Now, this might seem like 
you know, why, why is Paul speaking about the Gentiles this way? Isn't this kind of discriminatory? Um, you know, what, what is this? Um, but when Paul refers to these Gentiles, he's really referring to Gentiles in, the, in Paul's audience that have been admitted among the, the people of God here at this time. Uh, they're living in a culture uh, in the Roman culture at the time, in the Roman Greco culture, where many of the Gentiles practiced, you know, promiscuity. Sexual immorality was a norm of the culture. And most Jews regarded most Gentiles as worshipers of, of false deities. And there was a lot of injustice towards uh, towards the lower class, to women, and to uh, and to people who were generally considered more weak at the time. It was a part of the culture, it was a part of society to do that. And so he's calling on both the Gentile and the Jew who have come to know Christ to turn their lives away from those old patterns. Don't continue living as the Gentiles have or continue to do at this time. And then in verse 18, he says, they are darkened in their hearts. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. And then in verse 19, it says, they have become callous. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So what does it mean to be callous then? What is that word callous? And that word stood out to me. It, it, it jumped out to me as I was reading this passage. And the word callous, uh, in it, you know, the word callous means to be or become unfeeling and without shame. To be or become unfeeling and without shame. That is the Greek translation. Uh, interestingly enough, in, in physiological terms, one's flesh becomes used to a pressure point. And that's usually where we become callous in our flesh, right? Um, you know, I'm, I, I love playing the guitar. I'm a guitar player. And so um, I haven't played very much late, lately. And so some of my callous have sort of worn thin. But uh, for those of you who have played an instrument, a stringed instrument before, if you play enough, you'll grow some callus. It hurts at the beginning. And that's everybody, all guitar, first time guitar players, uh, sentiment that it hurts to play the guitar or hurts to play the violin or the cello or any stringed instrument. And, and they find it's very painful and sore. But the more and more you practice and more you play, uh, those areas that were sore, you begin to grow some callus because you've been constantly uh, uh, rubbing and pressing and, and your, your body responds by saying, okay, these are areas of pressure. So let's your body begins to respond by growing extra skin. For, the, for the, those of us who uh, have callus on their feet, this is more of a uh, common occurrence for most people, I think, in our, in our congregation. And anybody who is walking a lot or constantly on their feet, and I think maybe during the pandemic, some of our calluses have grown a lot thinner and our feet have become a lot smoother and and uh, a lot softer and a little more supple, right? Uh, and so when you, you know, as soon as all the shopping malls and, and, and the pathways are opened up, some of us have, you know, found, oh, my feet hurt when I was going for a walk that day, right? Uh, but some of us have kept up our physical activities and we've gone out jogging each day. Uh, and, and, uh, and your feet may be still callous. But regardless, uh, we can identify maybe with the callus part within our feet, either on your toes from rubbing the insides of your shoes 
or your heels from long days of being on your feet. We grow calluses to dull the pain. We grow calluses to dull the pain. It doesn't get rid of the pain. The pain's still there. Your body is still in pain. We may not feel it, but your body is actually responding and that's why we're growing callus. It's our body's natural response. We grow skin to protect us from further harm. But this reality is somehow revealing, well, what's really going on? Why are we growing callus on our feet? Maybe it's the way we wear our shoes. Maybe it's too loose, too tight, too small, too large. It's not necessarily a healthy thing to have so much callus on your feet. It means a number of things that your shoes don't fit properly or that we have improper postures. Yeah, I think in orthopedic terms, you know, you're either pronating or uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a pronator. So I'm, I'm, my feet are constantly kind of caving in this way. And so I have these callus on the outside of my, of my, of my uh, heels. There's different reasons for our callus. Now, there are many other causes that a callus uh, can occur, but these are amongst the popular ones. But what does this say about our spiritual lives? It's possible that there are things happening within, within our lives, our hearts, that are hurting and broken. And the only thing we've done is buy ourselves new shoes. Quote unquote, new shoes. To try to fix the problem. And we've often grown our flesh. But not fix the thing that is actually broken deep down inside. The next part of this verse says, and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Why do we resort to things like sensuality, greed, deeds of impurity? Many people look at these things and think, oh, you know, terrible people for doing these kinds of things. Our society has a deep problem with uh, sexual addiction. In fact, you know, I constantly hear about uh, problems about porno pornographic uh, abuse. All of, the, all of the news and media all the time. Where does that come from? And so easy to vilify people and say, you know what, uh, these are that's, that's a terrible thing and you, people are terrible for doing these kind of things. But I, I rather look at it from more, uh, you know, a spiritual problematic uh, disposition. That it's a symptom of people being very, very ill. That we're hurting. And people are resorting to these things because they're genuinely in pain. They need a place of acceptance, of pleasure, of whatever it may be. It's wrong on every level. It's morally and ethically wrong. But when we look at why, these are only a stem and an extension of the deeper problem that is actually occurring in people's hearts. Why do people fall into temptations of adultery? Adultery often comes from a source of dissatisfaction in their relationship, in their current relationship, or maybe even of themselves. And mostly, whether it's a relationship that they have with somebody else that's really going wrong, most of the time, even that in itself begins with the self. There's an issue deep within our hearts that we cannot resolve and thus 
that overflows into our relationships and eventually even overflows into adultery. Whether a single person who has been promiscuous or a married person who cheats on their spouse, there's a problem that belies within our hearts that one has not been able to reconcile. A callous heart causes us to grow in the flesh or grow more flesh or grow more fleshly, but covers up the broken issues that are truly within. We buy things often because it makes us feel better about ourselves. The nothing you buy or clothe yourselves with will solve your problems. No pleasure of the earth will solve our problems. They are just callous that grows over our pain to dull the pain. But the pain has never actually gone away. Our culture is constantly bombarding with an ideology that if we consume, you buy, you attain certain things in your life because it's for you. Even in the narrative that you shouldn't buy something to impress your neighbors, and I hear that all the time from people, don't buy anything to impress your neighbors, just buy it for yourself. Let me go one step further than that. Nothing you buy or attain or achieve in your life or even yourself is ever enough to heal the bones that are broken underneath. I remember back in university, uh, for the first time in my life, I, I was just watching TV a weekend after a Sunday, uh, you know, a Sunday afternoon when all the old movies are playing in the afternoon. And uh, you know, I sat down, just turned on TV, just wanted to relax. And I watched an old Steve McQueen movie. And I had no idea who Steve McQueen was at the time. Uh, and it was just by happen chance on a weekend. Uh, and there was a movie called The Great Escape. Uh, and, and this movie was, uh, it was interesting. <laughs> Because uh, I, I never thought I'd get into the, into an old movie like this, and uh, and I never really knew who this actor was. But after watching this film, I thought to myself, "Man, this guy is a really tough guy, especially in that leather jacket of his and riding on that motorcycle." I just I thought to myself, man, I want to be like Steve McQueen. And I discovered, and when I went online, there's a lot of guys who want to be like Steve McQueen, right? So after that, I was on the hunt for an old beat up leather jacket. I eventually found one. I found one that very barely fit. You know, it was, it was very awkwardly fitting. I was a small, skinny little guy in the university, you know. I, if you think I'm thin now, you should have seen me in my first year of university. I was a, you know, I was a pretty tiny guy. But, you know, being a little bit insecure about my, you know, my shape and my form, and I, I thought, you know, if I wear a, a tough leather jacket like this, maybe, you know, maybe the girls will pay attention a little more, right? Uh, and so I bought myself this jacket, you know, from, you know, from, from, a, from a local thrift shop. And I thought this is this is kind of cool. Maybe I'll look like Steve McQueen. And I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, "Do I really look like Steve McQueen?" No. Who are you kidding, buddy? Right? Did I really? No, I didn't. I looked in the mirror one day and thought to myself, "That looks nice," but you're not McQueen. You own a bicycle, not a motorcycle, buddy. Right? Joking aside. Growing more in the flesh doesn't repair the thing that is truly hurting inside. It doesn't change who you are or what's going on deep within. So how do we begin to repair? How do we look at life? The pandemic has caused many of us to be in a place of quietness of time spent alone, although much more busy for many, regardless, we've spent countless more hours this past year where we may have had to re-ask the questions. 
What am I doing with my life? Who am I? What am I doing here? Statistically speaking, over this past year, there have been more people who have been contemplating suicide than there has ever been before. The helplines have been flooded with people. Why is that the case? The times were very quiet and forced quietness to the point maybe even with domestic uh, domestic violence also on the rise and and domestic problems also on the rise. We also begin to discover how broken we are also as families. But the fact is that after this pandemic is over, how can we begin to move forward and begin to change our lives? How do we begin now, even before the pandemic ends, how do we begin to look at our lives now and what journey should we begin to prepare for ahead and this week as i talk about how we begin to prepare ourselves first before i begin to talk about the church you know verse 24 says let's talk about the new self okay the new self in verse 24 that is mentioned contrasted with the old the new person who is literally created according to God, which means according to his image or his likeness, has a calling. And Paul alludes to the way God originally made Adam and Eve in his image and says that the new person that a Christian has become is equipped with moral purity because he or she has made God morally and so we can now often attribute this idea of Jewish wisdom saying you have to become pure, you have to do all these things. But you know what, in order for us to do that, to become morally more pure, to become much more pure in, our, you know, in, in the way we carry our lives, also begins the work of the heart. That our hearts must begun, begin to become new. Our hearts must be renewed, begin to be in a place of rejoicing, of transformation, of change. And whatever was stored in our hearts before, whatever is stored in our hearts right now, that is hurting, that is rotting, that we must begin to cast that out. But it first begins with shedding off the flesh. You know, someone can on their feet, and this might seem a little bit kind of gross and a little bit graphic, but someone could have, you know, fungus on their feet and yet still have callus growing right over it, and it can begin to grow deep within. Men, for those of you who shave, you know the perils of an ingrown hair on your, on your chin or on your face. And if you don't go after it, it'll grow into a big lump on your face. The skin will grow and graft over it. And over time, you basically have to do your own self-surgery in order to remove it. It hurts. It's painful. but we have to remove it. And maybe that surgery begins now. That's where we begin to look at life. We have to think, I need to do the surgery today so I can live tomorrow. This silent time right now is for us to do the surgeries to get the treatment that we need from the Holy Spirit, from the Word of God, from the presence of God working in our lives today so that tomorrow we can live prosperously. 
And I don't think it's coincidence that God has given the church this period in time to be in quietness, to be in silence, to not be busy in doing all these religious and church activities, but to be in solitude in yourselves so that when you come back, you would be healed and come back rejoicing in each other's company and walk in that road of healing together in truth. And so we run into that very first point where we look down at verse 25, the very first step that Paul gives us in the how of how we begin to live in the new self is that very first point to speak truth. He gives us that, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Speak truth. Learn to speak truth. We have to stop lying to ourselves. Stop lying to one another. You know, when I look at this passage and, and, and I was asking myself, what does this mean? You know, in, in modern layman's terms, when we look at the scripture, it's often, con, you know, con, confusing. And we often think to ourselves, you know what, 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 is, what does this really mean? Does, Eugene Peterson says, what this adds up to then is this, no more lies, no more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. Stop pretending like you're okay. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. When you lie to others, you end up lying to yourselves. You know, you could say, Pastor James, I don't, I don't lie. What do you mean? Why are you accusing me of lying? I think we all lie at some point. And the lie is not necessarily a verbal lie saying, you know, I, you know, saying you own a, own a blue car, but you rather own a, you, you actually own a red one. That's not the lie, friends. The lie is when we say, I'm doing okay. The lie is when we say, my life is all together. I got all my junk in one place, but I got it all together, right? <laughs> it's usually how it really means. When we begin to be vulnerable with each other, when we come back together, my question is, will we continue to be the same old, same old? And the way we share and we discuss, are we discussing the deeper matters of our hearts where we begin to truly heal and to be be people who are healed by Christ, healed by the Spirit, whether we are young or old or, you know, or, or really young or wherever age we may be. Can we admit? Can we come to one another? Can we come freely to one, one another and be vulnerable with one another? Start living in truth and start speaking truth to one another? Can we speak truth in love, in trusting in God? Let's put away the falsehood. And maybe that's the first step. How do we begin to change when we begin to meet in person? Or maybe we begin that now online. Let's begin to speak truth. The second is not to sin because of our anger. So within our churches, we can you know, with churches and with one another, we can be truthful to one another. And the second is that we stop sinning because of our anger. There are some of us who grow more angry much more easily than, than some others. And some of us have a, a better grip on our anger than we do with some others. But I think, you know, for the church, we are not guilt-free on these matters. You know, it's very discouraging for me to be on, uh, be on the internet sometimes. I, I try not to 
look at the comment sections of, of even Christian blogs or forums. And it shocks me. It shocks me that even on Christian topics, there is so much anger and vitriol. And the temptation is to go and, and click on someone's profile to figure out who these people are. And I, I'll be, I'll admit that to you. I've done it a number of times and I found myself very disappointed because I often click and I discover some of these people are ministers too. And there's so much anger, so much vitriol online, even amongst Christians. How does the church change? How do we as Christians begin to change? We must admit, even as a church, we have anger issues. I do. We all do. Maybe this is an area that we may need to look ahead. An era of healing that we need to have. You know, hurt people get angry. If you're not hurt, why get angry? But the scripture says in verse 26, it says, be angry. Go ahead, be angry. Be angry. It's okay to be angry. Literally, it says that. And you're not misreading that passage. It's not a typo. Paul's intention says, be angry. But here's the challenge. Do not sin. Don't be a stumbling block for somebody else in your anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Give no opportunity to the devil to overcome you, to take advantage of that anger. There is nothing wrong with being angry, folks, but it is the actions that follow our anger. And as a church, I believe maybe there's somewhere we need to change there. Being more careful with our words, edifying, and turn that anger into something productive. We can be angry about some kind of injustice, speak the truth. Don't lie, don't skirt around that topic, but don't sin. Don't tear people down as we see the world do. When we see someone in the wrong, the public is usually very, very ruthless to come and tear people down for something that they have done wrong or said wrong. And as a church, how do we respond? Do we respond in anger and, and in inflammatory comments and, and things that tear others down? We are very quick to do that amongst each other, even as Christians, we are. And so maybe that is a point of change that we also need to change and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to transform and change us to give us righteous and holy anger versus ones that have sin. And the next is to live honestly. It may sound like the first point, but the, verse 20, 28 says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Some of us may, you know, I, 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 I have it in my mind, in my heart, thinking, you know, I don't think anybody in our church would live with this way, and I really hope not. But that maybe some people who are listening into this sermon, you know, after this is po posted online, they may hear this, who don't go to our church, they may hear this, and maybe I need to speak that to you. Live honestly. It's time to live honestly. Stop stealing from your neighbor. Stop being dishonest with your business. Stop being dishonest with your family members, with your friends. Live honestly and work honestly with your hands. 
And if you can't live honestly with what you are doing now, leave it. Leave that profession. And I dare say that. Leave that profession. And whether it is you make less money, go live honestly for the sake of your own salvation. The more we continue to live in dishonesty and cheating others out, the more we will find that callous grows more and more over the wounds of others and more and more over the wounds that are in our hearts as well. It is harder road to go back when that callus is so thick, it is hard to repair. So live honestly. Maybe someone in our church, this is gonna to speak to you. And next, remove corrupt talk. And this is, as I mentioned before, in our anger, and it relates so much to that that whatever is on our mouth, it says, verse 29, let no corrupt talk come from our mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may, be give, it may give grace to those who hear. And this is more practical. You can remove talk, but on the other hand, maybe I should have written here on the bottom, the real point is not, the removal of the corrupt talk, but instead speak to build each other up. When I live today in the way I live today, instead of speaking corrupt talk, you, know, you can remove the cor corrupt talk. Maybe you can just be silent about certain things and maybe that's not even helpful at all. And I would say rather the interpretation of the scripture tells us to do something instead. Replace that with talk that builds each other up instead of tearing each other down. So the practice and the real practical advice here is to build each other up as it fits the occasion. That it may give grace, practice grace, whether it's deserved or not, may give grace, that word grace. You speak with grace to people. Give someone a compliment, even if you feel like they deserve it or not. Not out of pity, but out of grace. Because God even speaks that of us. He loves us, we are cherished, and he constantly reminds us, even in our brokenness, even in our sin, he reminds us, of how we are cherished in his kingdom. For God so loved the world, right? And so do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What we sow into people's lives it shall become. I really believe that. The words that we sow in people's lives, you know, you can keep telling somebody, hey, you're terrible. You know, you're, you're, you're terrible at this or you're terrible at that. You, you think anybody's going to improve when we keep telling someone how terrible they are? Usually it goes the opposite way. They become even more terrible at what they do. But the more and more you encourage somebody as well, it's like, yeah, that's great. Keep going. Keep going. I see you improving. I see, your, I see your progress. I see it coming. Keep going. And we, we begin to encourage and we build each other up. They may not be there yet, but we can build each other up. And when someone comes to that point, they will become what we sow. There's power in those words. Just as Christ promises of us, uh, promises us his love, his promises, his salvation, we will become his redeemed people. And he has us remember that and believe that constantly in our lives, that we are his people. 
And the last one then in relation to that is to practice kindness versus vengefulness. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger clamor and slander be put away from you along all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. These are all layers that reveal a greater truth about where we need Christ's saving grace in our lives. And these are all layers, layers that can be peeled one by one. These layers are often painful and require deliberate intention to remove. But in order for us to heal, that which is truly hurting inside, we must begin to reconcile the broken areas of our lives. We must allow the saving grace of God to be at work in our hearts, to remove those old layers that have grown callous over those wounds. Psalm 23 writes, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And so let us begin to identify and recognize the areas of pain and hurt that we've grown numb and begin where the callus has grown thick. For when we begin to remove the layers that bind us, so when we begin to truly know the power of the Holy Spirit and the saving grace of Jesus Christ that truly frees us. Let us begin to identify and recognize the areas of pain and hurt that we've grown numb and where the callus has grown thick. For when we begin to remove those layers that bind us is when we begin to truly know the power of the Holy Spirit and the saving grace of Jesus Christ that truly, truly frees us today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, many of us, O oh Lord, have grown callous in our spiritual journeys. Maybe once we felt the presence of your spirit, we would rejoice and weep at the good news weep tears of joy, weep tears of sorrow because of our sin and our brokenness and our repentance before you. But Lord, many of us have grown also callous to the work of the Spirit in our lives. Our sin has often overtaken those areas of our heart and grown harder and harder on our hearts. And in turn, Lord, we've often forgotten our neighbors who are in such hurting, who are so vulnerable and in pain. Our hearts have been grown callous to that as well. So Lord, remove the calluses on our hearts. Take off those layers one by one, even if it hurts. We know that you are there with us through that journey. That even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, we will fear no evil for you are with us. Even if it means death to our pride, even if it means death to the areas that we are so 
afraid of. Lord Father, would you walk with us through that? That your saving grace may work in our hearts, transform us, transform our church, transform your people, O oh Lord, that as we see the end of this pandemic happening and as our church begins to form and come back together, Lord, that we would come ready to walk fully trusting in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, if you would like to give, uh, give offering, uh, if you are new or if you are not a member of our church, you are not uh, required to do that. Uh, we just, uh, you know, we ask you to pray with us and give thanksgiving for the things you have given. Church, if you would like to give, there's a link on the side to push pay, and you can give there or go through our website, Celebration PC, and, uh, and you can give there at any point in time that you need, but we encourage you to do that um, at, uh, at your nearest convenience if you can. But uh, let's pray for the offering at this time. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts you have given. For we know that all these things are yours. They do not belong to us. We are merely stewards of the, of the possessions you have given us here on earth. If you have called us to share, that we should share. If you have called us to give it away, that we shall. But Lord, you have called us to be stewards of it for your kingdom and put it on our hearts that we may not hoard it for ourselves, but Lord, that we may give to those in need, that we will be generous. And as the same for the church, as we take upon this offering, we give it to you saying, Lord, use these things for your kingdom's sake, for your name's sake, that it may be furthering your kingdom to reach those who are in pain, who are in hurt, who are in need that you would use this church to walk together, to walk as one body and one spirit to serve you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This time I'm going to invite our brother David, who can just lead us in the time of prayer, a prayer of hope. Thank you, uh, Brother James. We don't use that word a lot, but I love to hear that word because I grew up in a church where we used to say brothers and sisters all the time. Uh, but... Um, Anyways, brothers, sisters, friends, uh, thank you for uh, this time to, uh, to pray. I will just pray uh, a few items, uh, the COVID virus, obviously, uh, and um, the Thunder Team, I'd like to pray about them and uh, just uh, pray about our suffering and those of us who are going through difficult times and just uh, close with just a plea to get become closer to you, Lord, because that's really what we need to do. So join me now as we, uh, as we pray. Lord, we are, we are so far into this pandemic, it's, it's just become a way of life, Lord. Um, <clears throat> but it's not necessarily the life you, you intended for us, uh, but this is what we're in right now. And, and we, we know that there's going to be uh, hope around the corner, and, and we look to you for, for guidance, Lord, as we make decisions on how to change and <clears throat> how to uh, get back to service and, and do all the things that we do. And we pray for those who are uh, who want the vaccine, who are able to get vaccinated. We pray that the rollout will continue and more people will be vaccinated. And for those who don't have the vaccine, we pray that they will also be vigilant and stay safe um, through other means, Lord. Uh, but ultimately, we, we, we pray that as, as, uh, as Christians, we, we care about each other and we will do our best to make sure that we are, uh, we are safe, Lord, and that the people around us are safe. And we pray that, um, that those who are, who are becoming ill, that they will... Um, prevent the Lord from getting ill, but if they do, Lord, we prevent, we pray that they will uh, not have any uh, difficulties and, and, and severe hardship and that they will um, come out of it uh, well, Lord. I pray also for the Thunder team. We're so blessed to have a, a group of young people um, and maybe a few older ones as well who are able to play baseball. We never thought we'd get to this point. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that they're, they're doing well, Lord, but most importantly, well in the sense that they've actually won games and and their and their their record is very good but really lord we pray about their safety not just from being hit by the ball and and the bat and all the running and 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 sliding but also just the virus itself and, and other things like that 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 could impact them and 
we pray that they'll continue to follow the guidelines that were set upon them to to uh, to be safe. And uh, we thank you. we pray, Lord, that they'll be able to um, connect with each other and other people and the newcomers who are on the team. I pray right now for the suffering, Lord, that all of us are feeling. Uh, we're all suffering in, in our own way. Um, life is full of it, Lord. And um, I pray for anxiety. A lot of us are going through anxiety issues. We, anxieties are related to, uh, could be work. You could be worried that um, you don't, you can't find a job. And then you find a job, you're worried about the job that you're in and if it's the right job. And, and then you worry about, uh, you know, getting into university and then passing university and then finding a job and, or all these things in our lives that the uncertainty and health issues, many of us are waiting for health uh, results, um, tests Lord, or, or aches and pains that we have that we not sure what it is. And, and all of this, just this uncertainty Lord is, is weighing on all of us. And with the coronavirus on top of this, it's even more so. I pray that you'll leave our anxiety Lord and take away the suffering and just help us to put our faith in you, Lord, and, and to realize that we can't make everything perfect. We are going to, things will happen in life and we just have to deal with it and, and, and roll with it, Lord. And with you on our side and you as our guide, uh, let us always remember that whatever happens, it'll never be that bad because you have conquered death, Lord, and you promised us eternal life. I pray for those who are suffering because they have uh, family members who are sick or themselves are sick or ill, who are especially the older ones who are in um, uh, care facilities, Lord, there's just who are going through loneliness and, and just uh, difficulties right now, Lord, um, with, with their health, Lord. And we're all, uh, we know people who are in this situation and we pray for those who, and that you'll, you'll, you'll bless them and, and alleviate the pain and the suffering that they're going through, um, the loved ones around us. I pray that ultimately that we will be closer to you, Lord, as Pastor James preached today, that we will be honest with each other, with ourselves, and with you, Lord. What is the point of being dishonest to you, Lord? You, you see through us, you know us, you know everything about us, all our faults, all our thoughts, all our fears, all our anxiety, all our anger, Lord. Yet sometimes we still try to hide from you. And I pray that we will be honest in our every aspect of our lives, Lord, uh, with the ones we care about, the ones that we love here on earth, with ourselves and with you. And I pray that you will just um, be with us this week um, in the seven days between next Sunday, and, and you'll just take care of us and, and be with us always and help us to grow, Lord. Help us to continue to, to stay faithful, stay on the right path, whether it's reading the Bible or, or praying or just um, talking to other Christians. Uh, but ultimately, um, Lord, I pray that uh, we will all be able to draw closer to you with the hours that you have given us on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, David, for the prayers today. Let's, uh, let's receive the blessing at this time. If you are able to stand, uh, you can stand. I won't be standing because uh, otherwise you'll just see my, see my chest. So if you're able to stand, you would like to stand, you can do that at this time. But if you're going to receive the blessings with me as we close today's worship. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony and with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may with one voice, a one spirit, as one body, glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.